Yeah, so this is a bit weird, really, because um, I just came here as a guest, right? And then last night, I was having dinner with a man called Tim, who is there. Hello. Um, and he said, oh, we were just having a chat. And he said, oh, uh, let me just go and see someone. And then he said, can you talk tomorrow? So I had literally less than 24 hours notice for this. So forgive me if this isn't the most polished thing. But anyway, so here I am. Um, all I kind of want to talk to you about today um, is, I guess, my story, really. And at the end of it, I'm going to ask for your help, because it's not a story that's finished. It's still very much alive. And I'd really love to pull some of the brain, well, all of the brains, actually, in this room to help me on the next bit. So just bear with me, really. Um, so this is me. Unlikely but true, I love riding motorbikes. Um, and about three years ago, I was stuck in a job that I sort of hated. I felt it was one of those jobs that um, well, I was a stockbroker. And um, I guess my daily life was feeling lethargic, um, quite anxious, if I'm, if I'm honest. And with like a, a sense of dread and kind of self-loathing, because I knew I was doing something that wasn't really me. And there was a whole life out there. And people have talked about Technicolor. Uh, and my life was monotone. And I couldn't work out what it was that I should be doing. But I just knew that what I was doing really wasn't working. And I kept on going on these amazing trips, right? Um, this was one I did just in uh, 2010, um, riding off-road around South Africa uh, through a beautiful part of the world um, in the Wild Coast. And I kept on meeting these beautiful kids who were just blown away by the adventure of motorbikes. And I always really quite stunned that I was actually a woman, you know. So um, it was just a lot of fun. But then I just kept on coming back to my day job and thinking, well, so what? What do, what do I do with that? And I think it could have gone on for quite some time like that, just bouncing around, not really sure what to do with this idea and this love. Um, and then about three months after that happened, my gran, who at the time was like 88, 9, pretty old, uh, she's always been, she's, she's from the north, that's not really relevant, but she's, she's a very tough woman, um, and she's very like fiercely independent and slightly hard to love if I'm honest. But I, I do love her, really. And um, she had um, a fall in her care home, and she broke both the bones in her arm. It's really quite nasty. So she went into hospital, um, she had to have it operated on. And I went to see her the next day. And the thing that was weird was, um, almost overnight, she had shrunk down from being this, like, alpine goat of a woman, really, like, fierce and tough. And she'd just become elderly and frail and fragile. And we were, it was quite shocking to see, suddenly, and we were having a chat and um, just about stuff and how she's feeling and whatever. And she just said to me, I wish that when I was your age, I'd done the things I'd wanted to do and not the things that other people expected me to do. And I wish I'd been braver. And I just thought, oh my, you know, wow, that is, that's massive. And I thought, that's, that is tragic because arguably it's too late for her now because she's, she, you know, it's, her arm's buggered and... She's 80, ancient, you know? And um, that's awful that she's feeling like that. But also, what an amazing message, what an amazing gift she's just given me. Because, you know, I'm, at the time I was 28, um, stuck in a rut, arguably. I had my health, though, and I, you know, you realise how much that matters. And I suddenly thought, wow, the only thing that's stopping me from doing this Tim Pot crazy dream that I'd had for quite a while, which was to ride from London to Cape Town on my own on a motorbike, was fear, right? And what an amazing privilege that is that... The only thing that was stopping me was fear. You know, I had a little bit of money saved away, had my health, no kids, you know, to, which makes life arguably more complicated to do something like this. And I suddenly realised something more scary than doing this trip and God knows what could happen to me was the fear that one day life would slip along and I would wake up aged, well, let's be optimistic, 120 in the care home, <laughs> sipping Horlicks and thinking, damn it. I never did it, and she told me this could happen, and I never did, and I wish I had, and it's too late. So in that moment, I pretty much decided to go for it. Um, I won't pretend that it was necessarily an idea that was received with open arms from my friends or even my family. Certainly, my mum and dad took it pretty badly, because as you can imagine, um, they didn't really expect their youngest daughter to come out one day and say, Happy Easter. Um, bit of a surprise, I've decided to quit my job and ride from London to Cape Town on a motorbike on my own. Uh, so they were a bit horrified. And actually, I don't think it's really 
we can't blame them for it. Um, they went through a period of sort of mourning for me uh, and started speaking to me like I'd already died. So, <laughs> so they would say things like, oh, Claire, we've loved you so much, stuff like that. <laughs> and it, the thing was, it wasn't like they were trying to be emotionally manipulative in any way. They genuinely thought that I was going to die. And indeed, other people said to me, you know, in fact, I'll never forget one guy said... I hope you've come to terms with what is almost certainly going to happen to you. <laughs> Which was more than a little sinister, I, I don't mind admitting. But I thought, I'm sorry, I, I felt guilty, terribly guilty, because I thought, you know, I'm putting my parents through this horribly devastating experience. Um, and I felt awful about it, and I did think quite seriously about whether I could do that to them, because that's arguably what I was doing. But, and it's really selfish, but there was something in me, some instinct perhaps, that just said, you have to do it. It doesn't, the rest of it will, will be fixed. And somehow I didn't actually believe that I was going to die. People say I was brave. I wasn't. I was in denial. I'm quite clear about that. But actually, I just, it was something I had to do. So I set off. The next six months was quite a blur. Um, I was amazingly lucky insofar as I picked the bike. This is a Suzuki DRZ 400cc scrambler thing. And I rang up Suzuki and said, look, I think I need to do some modifications to the bike to make it ready for the trip. Um, and they said, oh, what trip? So I kind of explained. And they said, well, that's kind of interesting. Do you want sponsorship? <laughs> so in exchange for some spare parts and mechanical support, they had my blogs. And that was really fantastic, actually, really generous. That was a bit of good luck. Ah, skipping a bit. So I imagine in the interest of time, you kind of want to know what happened on the trip uh, and the highs and the lows and stuff. Um, I guess in terms of um, whether I died, the answer is no. Um, were the horrible, <laughs> horrible, yeah, it's not a mirror. Um, in terms of, like, did anything horrible happen? Because that's the next thing people want to know. Yeah, it did. Um, it, in terms of what was worst, um, Egypt was horrible. Um, if you turn up there as a woman, in my experience, if you turn up there as a woman on a motorbike, the general perception is that your family must have rejected you, that you must have no honour, and therefore you're fair game. Which led to me being chased through deserts, and um, molested and groped, and it really wasn't pleasant. And it got to such a bad point one evening that I actually seriously thought, having been chased for, I think, two weeks by this point, chased through, through a country, I mean, um, I thought, I don't think I can do this anymore, because I don't, I don't think I am brave enough, whatever bravery really means anyway. And I just, I, I, I was too afraid to go out, and it was, it was horrible. And then I basically realised, well, apart from the fact that even if I do give up, I've got to ride out of here somewhere. And if I give up and go back north, I've got to live all this again. I may as well keep heading south and get over it. But I really believed that it was going to get better. I don't know why, but I really thought this has got to get better. And I also had this little thing in the back of my head, which was before I'd set off, I wanted to do something positive with my kind of financial background. So I contacted a microfinance organisation based in the UK, but actually working in Malawi. And I said, look, can I just come and and just be with your organisation for a couple of months and hopefully I've got something to offer. And they said, yeah, sure. And apart from anything, it'll be really, really inspiring for those women who we lend to, these village women, to see a woman who's ridden here all on her own on a motorbike. You have no idea what that, that's going to mean to them. And I always kept that in my brain, that whenever things got tough, I always thought of those mamas, you know, who I hadn't even met yet, and just thought, they are, that is my target. That's why I'm keeping going, these women. So I kept going. I did have some comedy experiences along the way, and it kind of came back to the point that people had said in the first place, which is the assumption that the minute that you leave the borders of Europe, all hell breaks loose and people are not humans anymore, they're like terrifying machines or something. And you realise how skewed our perspective is on a continent like Africa, because we've taken the very worst of the crises that have hit that continent over the last however long you like, and assumed that life is still like that. So... Indeed, when I crossed the border from Sudan into Ethiopia, the border guard said to me, a big burly guy with a massive gun, he said to me, uh, where are you from? Like, dead in the face. Quite frightening. And I said, uh, England. Because I was doing the, the, my like, general defence mechanism was to do the, the chirpy British girl thing, because it confused people. So I was like, oh, England. And he went, ah, I see. And I said, um, he said, please tell your people 
we are not starving here. That was 30 years ago. We're a developed country now and we have enough food. I was like, yeah, that's a fair point. I'm sorry. Uh, I am sorry. And I will go back and tell my people. He goes, thank you. And then started laughing. So it was okay. But I kind of thought, he's got a point there because, yeah. Maybe we do need to hear some good news sometimes. And there is plenty of it to be had. Egypt was the worst, but I had hundreds of fantastic experiences and generosity, particularly from women, it must be said. Some men too, they were great. But the number of times where I was literally on the floor in a heap of mud under my motorbike, having had a crash or two, and these mamas would just appear from nowhere, like it was totally normal to have somebody sliding through their front <laughs> garden. <laughs> Or, you know, looking like a space invader with no idea. <laughs> and they would just sort of, you know, come up to me, give me a hug or whatever. Didn't matter that I was not from that part of town or that I was obviously deeply strange. They just treated me with love, you know, and care. And it was, and often a laugh, you know. It's fantastic how restorative that proved to be. So um, that was a fantastic thing. Anyway, so I then got on to Malawi to this... Um, microfinance project, and I was thinking, brilliant, I'm going to learn loads about microfinance, I hope I'm going to offer them a lot, blah de blah Anyway, they wisely concluded that they didn't want my financial expertise, I don't blame them, but they did say, actually, where we think you could help us is um, the way this charity, oh, that's, sorry, so this is me as Mystic Meg, I had to go native after all the male attacks in Egypt, which worked quite well, so that's what this slide was about, this was me leaving the country, that was a crash, that's me and my little mascot, Muddy and whatever, where are we? Here. So, I got to uh, Malawi, and they basically said, look, we've got a problem. Our charity is different to all the other microfinance charities, as far as we don't set up a shop in a village and ask the ladies to come to us. We acknowledge the fact that the women in greatest need for help are in the villages. So we put our loan officers on motorbikes, and we go out. Brilliant. Only issue was, the guy who'd come up with this idea wasn't a biker, and couldn't really work out why it was that the costs were going through the roof with these bikes and why they were breaking down and there'd been some crashes and major problems and frustrations. So he said, look, you must know about motorbikes, right? No. Uh, but please, can you do anything, something to help anything? Quite a, a blank canvas, really. So I just thought, well, I'll, I'll try, but I'm not a mechanic. I don't know what I can offer. I really don't, but I'll give it a whirl, you know? Within half an hour of turning up at the office, I'd kind of come to the conclusion as to what was going wrong. And that was these guys never did any maintenance at all, nothing. And if you can imagine riding a motorbike off-road on sand and grit and stone, rainy season, dry season, whatever you like, these bikes were taking on royal battering. And I realised, actually, I do know a bit about bikes because I've been keeping my bike running for the last 15,000 kilometres and it hasn't broken down once and I haven't even had a puncture, which is amazing given the amount of off-roading I was doing. Bit of luck in there, but there's a bit of skill, small. So what I did was I came up with this um, idea of producing a manual called Love Your Motorcycle. <laughs> Very much into love. And I wrote this thing, and it kind of went through each point of how to check on your motorbike to see if there's anything going wrong, but also how to look after it. So if the chain's too loose, how do you tighten it? If the filter's dirty, how do you clean it? Stuff that is really cheap and easy to do. The tools come with the bike that you've got, so you don't need to buy anything and it prevents really big issues happening and crashes, but also keeps the bike running more efficiently, so it's kind of win-win. So I went round to all the regions in Malawi where these guys had hubs, and I taught the loan officers how to ride these bikes. Not ride these bikes, maintain the bikes. As you can imagine, they were a bit confused at first as to why this white girl had turned up, teaching these big burly blokes how to look after their motorbikes, because what would I know after all? But, um, but in the end, once they realised I'd ridden there on this bike and whatever else, they thought, well, maybe she knows something, and we'll listen. And actually, we had a, a lot of fun. And so anyone, by the way, I feel really strongly about this, that a lot of people had said to me before I did this, oh, this is a horrible thing. Oh, Africans don't do maintenance. What is that? What is that? Africans don't do maintenance. Now, I'll tell you what, if you, in my experience, if you go to Malawi and you explain to somebody why it's necessary and how they can do it and teach them on their level and make it fun and make it understandable, they really want to do it because it makes themselves look smart. They actually really like tinkering. Who doesn't? And it helps, and they get that. So where that idea comes from, I don't know. But anyway, so I had a lot of fun doing this. And uh, that's air filter stuff. And we had a lot of fun. Anyway, I met all the mamas, and they were brilliant fun. And, and that whole kind of mental picture I'd always had about 
riding out to see these mummers eventually one day. This is one of the groups of women who had taken donations or loans from the microfinance organisation, and it had allowed them, these illiterate women, to send their children, often there were 10 kids, thanks, to secondary school, which is an amazing leap of progress, right? And they were just really inspiring, energetic, funny women, and I loved it. Anyway, I eventually got to the finish, that was the Cape of Good Hope, alive, as in actually alive, but also just brimming with life, you know? Like, I was really alive. It wasn't like in my old job where I'd become this deadened person. I was really alive and happy. But I didn't quite know what to do when I came back to the UK. So I spent six months in Scotland trying to write a book about what I'd done, which was really hard, actually, because it's quite an isolating thing to do at the best of times to write a book. It's really, really hard. And I was living in the remote highlands, which kind of compounded it. So after six months, I realised this was pretty tough, and I probably, for the time being at least, needed to move back to London and get a job and kind of regroup a little bit. So I just like this picture, because um, this was about two weeks before I went back to London, and I took some of my neighbour's kids round on this bike, and I, they just got really excited about it, and I kind of hoped that I'd pass on a bit of the motorcycling magic to them. So I got back to London, and unfortunately, within two weeks of being back in London, I got up to go to work one day, and I went out to the front of my flat, and the bike was gone. Hmm. Uh, honestly, I was that devastated. Because it was almost like my wings had been clipped. Ooh. So that was pretty shit. <laughs> hmm. But anyway, I'll crack on. The good thing was, about a month later, I went to an overlanding event. And a very nice man called Ron came up to me, big beaming smile. And he said, look, I, I hear that you're very much into maintenance. Yep, <laughs> kind of a geeky thing, but I am, I guess. And he said, brilliant. I'm involved with this charity called Motorcycle Outreach. It's small and it's volunteer run, but we're putting healthcare workers on motorbikes in Indonesia, right? Oh, brilliant. He said, well, we're about to start a new project in Tanzania. Oh, great. And he said, uh, do you want to be involved? So I did. And about six months later, I happened to meet the local implementation partners, it's all local guys in Tanzania, and I was dead excited about it. And they said, look, the thing that, the problem we've got is like the local guy, he's um, called Herman Gild, he's, he's a very experienced medic, he's a consultant to the government, he is top, top, top quality, but he freely admits he knows nothing about motorbikes. And that's a bit of an issue, because we're trying to put midwives on motorbikes to ride out into the remote communities. Why? Why would you even do that? Well, Tanzania's got a massive problem, as a lot of developing countries have with maternal mortality. So every day, 24 women in Tanzania, mothers, die in pregnancy and childbirth through preventable causes. And when you hear that stat, and you think about all these wonderful, beautiful, funny, cheeky women that I've met, and you think of 24 of them, it's a minibus of women every day dying from preventable causes. You just, it just felt, filled me with horror. So I wanted to be involved with it, and they said, look, can you come out to Tanzania for a week and do your stuff and teach these midwives how to ride the motorbikes and help set this thing up so that it's going to work and we can just start small, scale up big and take over the world one day. So I did. So I went out there and um, trained these midwives and it was absolutely fantastic to be back in Africa and doing all this motorbike stuff. But I guess I kind of realised that I've kind of got a weird range of niche skills, I suppose you could say, um, which I kind of love doing and I love the motorbike stuff. I love training these midwives and these healthcare workers. They, they loved learning. And they also said, you know what, we've got a big problem out here because like 80% of people who are currently pretty much anywhere in East Africa in an A&E have had a motorbike crash and that's why they're there. And there's an element of that because they didn't know how to ride a motorbike and they kind of bought a license. But there's another part which is they just aren't looking after their bikes and it's a massive problem. It kind of set me off thinking. Anyway, the day five of this event came around and... Um, thanks. It was the launch party of this event. It was basically a way of trying to get the local villagers to understand what was happening so that they could use the service. And also it was a way of, well, basically national TV cameras and stuff had come down to record it to get the message out nationwide to help put constructive pressure on the government to put more budget into this stuff. Anyway, at one point I get sort of said a few words during this thing, which was fine. And then um, basically the guy who, uh, who was comparing the whole thing and said, and now, Sister Clara... 
Uh, we would like you to come up and dance with the local women. <laughs> and that, I mean, to be honest, audience participation is my hell. So I thought, well, this is a nightmare. But I'm on national TV now, so I can't really refuse. <laughs> and there's 200 women here who, uh, who kind of are expecting me to go up. So you, you kind of got to go. But the beautiful thing about it was, and the massive relief, to be honest, as well, was that as soon as I stood up, the boldest woman just kind of charged at me <laughs> and gave me this massive great hug, like bone crusher. These women are built strong. At which point, another woman then came rushing up to me and also gave me a hug. I was hugged by 150 women. <laughs> and so I didn't have to do the dancing because it ended up being like a kind of serial hug thing. But the point was, they were so... Which is extraordinary. But um, so bruised and battered, I realised that this was a beautiful thing because these women were just so grateful that... Not really, it wasn't about me, it was about the charity and what the project was doing and the fact that we were bringing them hope and that they would have a better chance of their, themselves surviving, their sisters and their, their mothers and everybody. It was just a fantastic thing. So where does that leave me? Well, I came back from Tanzania about three weeks ago and I went back to my job, as I do, and I still can't quite work out what to do and this is the part where I kind of throw it open to you, really. I'm still obsessed with motorbike maintenance really not very cool at all, but I am. I care about it because my boyfriend the other day, we were driving along the car and he was trying to explain to me how it was such an extraordinary moment that Arsenal had won against Aston Villa 4-0. And as he was explaining this fascinating fact, um, I heard this like motorbike, really, uh, this motorbike coming around and I heard this like noise I, I can't do an impression of, but I heard it and I thought, I think his chain's too loose, right? <laughs> and I went, Anthony, stop, as he was rambling on about Aston Villa again. And, and indeed, this, this chain was practically jumping off the sprockets of this bike. And so I had this moral dilemma, like, can, do you say something? Do you stop the guy? Because he's arguably this thing's about to jump off the sprockets, he's going to have a crash, right? Anyway, the point of saying that is I can't stop being obsessed with motorcycle maintenance. And I realised that we have this problem in Tanzania, but we have it here too. Nobody teaches motorcycle maintenance. We have great education for learning how to ride a bike. We have great education for all kinds of things, off-roading, whatever you like. But who teaches maintenance? No one. Not that I've heard of anyway. And I just think that that's kind of missing. So somehow I, I want to do something with that. And I want to do something in Africa too. And I want to be able to empower women and men to look after their bikes and take pride and keep themselves safer and help their own communities. Because motorbikes aren't all about hell's angels and murder. <laughs> you know, they can be used for really, really good things. And I'm not a hell's angel, I'm not. So I guess that's my challenge, is if anybody can work out for me or help me or give me a suggestion or any way of saying this is maybe a route that you could look at, because I just haven't joined up the dots in my brain yet, I would be massively grateful. Um, and I, I think it could be quite exciting. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.